It's been over four flippin' years since we have done the Final Destination series kill counts. Now, I want I had to make doubly sure about four this. Four years later, we're doing number four. Four, exactly. So we that, have to wait five years before we do the one that comes after this. I'll be 40, dude. God dang. <laughs> I don't like that. Oh. I don't like being almost 35. Imagine being 35. Oh, wait. <laughs> <clears throat> so, hilariously, when we did the last Final Destination, you know, Final Destination 3 kill count, uh, back on September 12th, 2019, back when we still lived in the mansion, Jesus. Now here we are in the in the manor, and things are things are going good. And lo and behold, I looked in our uh, I looked in our little uh, request channel on our Discord, and what do my eyes see? Final destination, or no, the final destination, kill count, reaction request by Cyclone Shadow. God, four fucking years. <laughs> I'm pr still probably gonna have to censor that. Four years. Not only that, but we did a reaction to Final Destination 5 as part of our Seven Nights of Fright back in 2019. And that one's somehow still on the channel. Oh, yes. Well, the thing is, the movie reactions, they're, they've loosened up a lot more on them here in the last few years. I know some of them went poof, though. Well, some of them... Did, well, the one that always went poof was when we were trying to do the 13 Nights of Fright... And we tried to do the Lost Boys. The Lost Boys got flagged every single time. I reposted probably that video, I would say, 40 times. Probably because of the song. Oh, no. It kept getting flagged. Like I, Even after I muted the song. I muted the song and went around it. Even after all that, it still got flagged and still couldn't be posted. Uh, let's see. Oy, I wonder. Did I delete the last one that I did? Oh, damn it. Damn it, damn it, damn it. The Lost Boys. Di no, it's still, it's not up here. Instead, we, uh, in the Nostalgia Critic, uh, the Lost Boys video me and Chad did back in, back in 2020. Jesus. 2020 feels like so long ago now, man, and that was arguably... Okay, not arguably. It was the worst year in, like, the last ten years, easily. I mean, Jesus. <clears throat> but, <clears throat> anyway, the final destination. Here we go, ladies and gentlemen. It has been way too long since we have been back to this series in terms of a, uh, in terms of a reaction. So, here we go. Are you ready? Are you ready, Nick? I am ready. All right. Here we go. Kick it. Welcome to the Kill Count, where we tally up the wow. victims in Look at that old set. <laughs> I'm James A. Pierce, and today we're looking at the Final Destination, which is a fancy way of saying Final Destination 4 and or Final Destination 3D. Yep, this is the much maligned 3D extravaganza that came out in 2009, the same year as Saw 3D. Perhaps it's not a coincidence, then, that I fucking hate both these movies. <laughs> also, heads up, I'm recording this after I got back from SummerSlam, and my voice is still kind of shot. Hey. Sorry, but that's oh. bound to happen after you Witness Seth Rollins frog splash Brock Lesnar through an announcer's table. That was a killer SummerSlam. That was a gr dude. SummerSlam 2019 was such a good SummerSlam. And your eyes don't deceive you. That is in fact Chelsea and me back. There. <laughs> <laughs> get it, <laughs> get it. Final four, which I'll call it to save time, has a lot of the same problems as its pink-blooded Saw brethren. Primarily the fact that all of its characters are walking, talking, gaping assholes that'll afflict any viewer with a serious case of misanthropy. Characters have yes. never been Final Destination's focus, but as the movies <coughs> carried on, the side characters evolved from being boring and forgettable to obnoxious and cynical. With Yeah, uh, I'll say this. The best side characters probably was in the second film. I mean, because they were at least memorable... Although they were a little more annoying than... They, they were annoying to a fault. But at least you remember them. 
The third one, the third one, I think had the, I don't know. The third one, I think had probably the best overall story. The first one, first one just set it off, and I think had the better characters. Each each Final Destination movie of like the first three had something that was genuinely the best of in each degree, but by no means were any of the films like perfect or or even like great for that matter. I mean I enjoyed them. They're good like popcorn, like munching, like kill like kill catastrophes, but I don't know. I it this film none of the characters I liked. None of them. Whereas in Final Destination Five, that's that's my favorite Final Destination by far. Easily. It's not even close. With everyone either a snarky douchebag or a walking hard on. Final Four is the culmination of that evolution. And while some people argue that this is intentional because watching shitty characters die is enjoyable, that only gives fault. us a few bloody moments of satisfaction. The other <coughs> whatever minutes, we've just got to sit there and deal with their bullshit. Once again, James Wong and Glenn Morgan, who made the first and third movies, were swapped out with writer Eric Bress and director David R. Ellis, who made the second movie. Meet the new boss, same as the old boss. Perennial producer Craig Perry also returned, always a champion of increasing the gore. But unfortunately for Final Four, the graphic kills, which have always been the sole strength and indeed raison d'etre of the franchise, are really unsatisfying. Everything looks way too cartoonish and fake. And I get that this movie is going for a it's more. Because it was all made for the 3D bullshit where it pops out the screen at you. It's like, it's coming at you. 3D, man. I was like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Look, 3D when it's used for cinematic effect can be beautiful. For instance, Avatar, How to Train Your Dragon, all of them. And then not only that, but the one that everyone forgets about, Hugo. Which, I really wish you all could watch that in 3D on this TV. Because it is breathtaking with like how the cinematography works in 3D. Anyway, sorry. Tone, but make me laugh at jokes or circumstances, not your shitty digital effects. How many people Ugh. will die as this series hits rock bottom? Let's find out and get to the kills of the final destination. <clears throat> stupid. It is stupid. The movie begins with a pretty cool song by Shinedown. Awesome, I'm fucking pumped. Too bad this movie's about to shit the bed hard. This not NASCAR race at McKinley Speed Shine Down that did that song. Dig in, dig in. Yeah. Way is being it's probably the best fire. song they have, if that's the case. <laughs> Are soon never to be heard anything else by them that sounded that way decent. Mmm, that's true, yeah. Prognosticator Nick, played by Bobby Campo, who would go on to be that affair having teacher in the Scream TV series. Which, yes, mm. I've seen and I enjoy, and I hope to one day cover it somehow. He's here with more model cutout characters, like his girlfriend Lori, her friend Janet, and this hunt dude, who's here actively rooting for the drivers to crash and die. And you're gonna have to scrape them off the fence with a shovel. A shovel? Wow, hon, you're so fucking cool. Our future deja vu moments to herald the upcoming disaster include a binoculars flask, the kids share with a nearby couple, some signs that this building is in need of repairs, an obfuscational cowboy who's a gentleman enough to move for the sake of their sight lines, and Emmanuel over there putting tampons in her kid's ears for sound protection. Because yeah, a real person would totally do. Yeah, that's, no. My mom is, my mom's a very practical person, and if I complain about the noise, she's not gonna put tampons in my fucking ears. Any good parent would actually have earplugs for their kid if they knew they were going uh, to Also, place. you're at a racetrack. Yeah. They sell earplugs. FYI, in case you didn't know and you ever get asked to go to a NASCAR track, you're going to need earplugs. Or ear protection, like yeah. noise-canceling headphones, it's, at least. It's louder than a concert. It's oh, by far. fucking loud. Yes. You're not going to be able to hear shit anybody you came with says the entire time until it's over. Yeah, me, Ethan, and Kristen, when we went, we actually had, like, noise-canceling headphones that had, like, a little uh, communication thing in it. Like, it was, like, all three of our things were connected, and we all, like, could hold up mics and just be like, hey, you want me to go get some popcorn? Yeah, that sounds good. Can you get me a drink while you're there? Sure thing. <laughs> yeah, 
And it was awesome. I don't know if they even put mufflers on those things, but sure doesn't fucking sound like that. They don't. They don't. (laughs) They are intentionally loud. You know how it is. You're down there by the fence, all of a sudden this is... I lived like maybe 10 miles away from the racetrack. Maybe 15. Um, Like all of my childhood, every time there was a race happening at Bristol Motor Speedway, you could hear it over the mountain. Like... Like all evening long. So, and by the way, my house. by the way, we're not talking about like a little rinky dink uh, racetrack, by the way. We're not talking about like a mom and pop racetrack like what these people are. No, we're talking about Bristol Motor Speedway. Yeah, it's literally legitimate NASCAR track. 170,000 people can fit in that fucking place. It is a quarter mile, it, it is, there is a half mile track, and it is insanity. Literally whatever here it blows because everybody and their brother comes to town whenever there's a race. Like yes, everything gets way overcrowded. And not only that, but it's a bu- It's usually a bunch of drunken assholes who who clog up I eighty one and are angry when you aren't going one hundred and twenty. And they and when they pass and when you, you work at the movie and music retail store. They come and ask and things like, "You got that new Shine Down CD in that new Final Destination movie?" Oh dear God! <laughs> the one that's in three D. <laughs> oh. Like. Yeah, but you aren't going to be able to watch it in 3D. Well, why not? That seems like a ripoff. It's like, That's hey. false advertising. I could report you all to the BBB. The BBB. The BBB. The BBB. Jesus Christ. Fuck y'all. Fuck you too. I'll briefly see other future fugitives of death. All the while, you just smell nothing but like just pure alcohol while you're talking. Pure alcohol and Copenhagen. Yeah. Like Copenhagen Chaw, that's uh, all you Alcohol see. covers up the Copenhagen. Like, Sometimes. To that point. ...there with his girlfriend and a super unsubtle racist dude who... Oh, uh, unsubtle. You don't say. What gave it away? Was it the giant red swastika on his fucking forearm? I might have to actually censor that to get this on. It's actually. partially it's partially obfuscated, I've been so... even saying the word, though. I'm not sure if we can actually talk about that. Oh, uh, boy. I don't know. I guess, but at the same time, you know, you know, like, okay, Bill Burr pointed this out in films. He's just like, he's like, you ever seen those like cartoonishly racist people? Not, you know, not like a real world racist where, you know, they'll say something, they'll say something that's, that's racist, but it's just like, it's just like, it's just like so like non, like non sequitur, it doesn't matter. Versus the ones that you see in films that are just so blatantly racist that it's just like it, it's hilarious of the fact that yeah this isn't real life this is not how this would go in real life like anyone who yells that out at a like at a race or at a like a place in this regard yeah I'm sorry they're getting kicked the fuck out doesn't even it doesn't matter if it's in the deep south or anywhere else dude there was a guy. Who yelled like at a rate at a NASCAR like, was talking about Bubba Wallace. This was back when Bubba just started, and he yelled at like he he was just like somebody tell that N word to get off the goddamn track. You know what happened? Security came and removed him within five minutes. You know and you know what? Well deserved. Mm-hmm. It and it's just like. <sighs> Bill Burr also said, he's like, if there's ever a cartoonishly racist guy in a film that he's getting cast in, he's like, can I play that guy? Mm-hmm. Bill Burr wants to play the cartoonishly racist guy in a, in a movie. I'd let him. Yeah, if they're to that point in real life, <coughs> they, they really can't be because they can't really walk around without getting their asses kicked. By oh, them. yeah. By just normal, everyday people, because... Because there's a lot of normal, everyday people that would love to punch a racist in the face. Oh, exactly. It's a good excuse. Oh, elbow so. a motherfucker in the nose. Mm-hmm. That's just like we had some some racist ass hats show up to one of the UCW shows. And it was just like, just feel like... At, he was at first being like really nice and everything. Then he started to get a little drunk. When he started to get a little drunk, he started yelling out... He started yelling out uh, just... You know, it's like and stuff. Well, yeah. Well, not really like... Not blatant slurs, but then eventually he's just like, "Dear God, man, half the wrestlers here look like they got freaking tire treads for freaking lips." And I was like, "And we were, and I remember it was, I remember it was K heard him say that. 
Kay turned around to him and said, you need to get the fuck out of here, dude. I'm not joking. You need to get the fuck out of here right the fuck now. I'm not joking. And he was like, what did I do? And then all of a sudden, he was just, a, it basically became a, a little bit of a scene. Uh, you know, security escorted him out, and that was that. Mm. But it's just like, we don't play that shit, man. We don't, by any stretch. That's fucking, that, that's old, archaic bullshit and doesn't belong anywhere. Period. Anyway, sorry. Whistles Dixie tunes at George, the <coughs> black security guard. This movie's disaster kicks off with Death's go to spell, Gust of Wind. Ooh. He must be a huge Fletch Stormtail fan. It's wind all the fucking time with this guy. Like, what? Your wind can unscrew bolts now? That's some OP. No, nah, that's vibration. You know, it, I mean, how else are you supposed to show an invisible death like to everyone? I mean, I don't know. I guess, I guess, well. Oh, death is here. The wind is blowing. But for me, like wind isn't isn't doing this. It's the vibration. Yeah, is. like that's that's just standard. The wind death. A premature pit stop exit leaves a metal doohickey in the road, and that causes a disaster that starts killing people with effects that could have been done by any seventh grader with an Adobe subscription. The Ooh. deaths come via crushing, torso cutting, and Looney Tunes sound effects. They also come via 3D wood shards. Whoa. Whoa! We see a ton of nameless cartoon characters killed in various ways before Hunt and Janet are cartoonishly crushed by a chunk of ceiling. Then <coughs> even more nameless cartoons suffer the same cartoonish fate. It's weird to me that this looks so bad because they're just using the same technique they did in part two, combining green screen shots with some digital additions. It's just the digital VFX that they're adding <laughs> don't have any weight to them. Mm -hmm. they, they, they're they literally, it's like they're taking a PNG and they're put, starting it here, and then it's just like, here. That's it. Whereas real rubble, when it falls, would be like, you know, it would have movement to it. There's no movement. If there was movement, it'd be more believable. They may be using roughly the same technique, but... I'd be willing to bet that's not the same visual effects artists. I'd be willing to bet the same. They probably cheaped out and got like some VFX artists fresh out of like college who didn't know how to how to animate properly. I don't know if it's the lighting or the parameters of their keying effect or what, but for some reason, everything looks real fake. Which is a damn shame, seeing as how they filmed a bunch of cool practical stuff at the Mobile International Speedway <coughs> in Alabama. Like, they had an actual car on actual fire slide down a green screen track into a pillar and a dummy. But in the actual movie, that shot doesn't feel so real. Yeah, I think it coming out of the smoke... <coughs> I think it coming out and of the all smoke. All the other effects around it look terrible, so you just kind of into a pillar tells you and the a dummy. Yeah. The yeah. Just like look at this. Look at this. It's, it's like look at that smoke. That smoke is stock standard, and then not only that, but the way the car comes through it, it's almost like it, it's not like the car's coming through it. It's like the car is just like popping the, in. Yeah, the smoke right here. The, the car the literally. The car literally pops in like. Right there. Mm. Where's the car? Where's the car in the previous frame? It's not there. Instead, Spoiler. it's a yellow bulge. Yeah. That's it. It's a yellow bulge, and then in pops the car. Doesn't feel so Boom. Real. Part Done. Part of me doesn't understand why they shot anything with dummies. <laughs> like when they slingshotted a 40-pound engine into one. Since in the movie, it all ends up looking digital. This premonitious disaster ends after Nick watches <coughs> Dorian George get consumed by a fiery explosion that also blows him back and impales him. Whoa! whoa, whoa, whoa secret red in a racetrack! Nick gets one look at the binocular booze, the stylish cowboy, and those tampon earplugs, and he knows they've got to get the fuck out of there. His rush to leave calls Causes, as always, a fight to break out. And, Sorry. as always, a bunch of people get caught up in it and eject themselves from the situation, with the racist dude Carter telling his wife to stay in her seat. And, yeah, they named another character in the series Carter. No, I don't know why, since we all know there's only one thing you think of when you hear that name in a Final Destination movie. Carter, you did it! Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
characters yell at each other outside until they hear the crash taking place inside and see some awful looking fiery chaos. Are you shitting me? Just a whole reason I come to these stupid redneck things. Dude, it looks like the stage show for Nero's flute concert back there. What the fuck's the matter with you? <laughs> anyway, most of what we saw in that vision is taking place right now. You know, minus the main characters dying. And a news report later literally spells out that 52 people died in the catastrophe. So we'll count 51 deaths right here with a big old thanks to Action 7 for doing my job for me. And I took one off because while the racist dude Carter argues with security guard George about going back inside for his wife, the mechanic's wife, Nadia, gets killed by a wayward tire yeah. flying through the air. I'm assuming Damn. that news were Yeah. Oh boy. Or counted her among the 52. The effect when it first happened. Oh, remember that. Yeah. Just. I just hate. It's just like. Once again, the in between. It's just like. It's, and, it's a terrible. Bad, but like, I will. Yeah, like it's not even lined up with where it hits her body. No, it goes through her. Oh, no, I mean, like, it goes through her, but look where it goes through her. Like. Everything should have exploded forward from like her breast line up, basically. Yeah. But instead, it's just like a red splatter. It's only like, and when it goes forward another frame or two, see, it only takes off like her top left uh, part. Yeah. But the way the tire went through her, it should have taken off like everything. It, her arm should have went out to the yeah. side. Yeah. Like right here, like at least everything. They might here. have had to like undo some of the gore. <clears throat> the sake of like getting it past the rating ratings board or whatever but, speaking like, of this video is probably gonna get we're probably gonna get demonetized for this because just like that effect just sucks pretty bad but i will give credit to the practical corpse they show afterward then we get thank you for censoring that james <coughs> and a title card and the most badass opening credits i've ever seen in them a dope ass hard rock theme plays over x-ray depictions of the kills we've seen happen in the series. It's all very stylized and does a great job getting the viewer excited, since it reminds them of the best thing these movies have always had going for them, the gory graphic kills. But after that, we're back to the kill-free parts of the movie, which is never much fun in this series, because we gotta sit here listening to shitbag characters like Hunt. It's your choice, heads or tails, but you know I like head. A memorial is held for the accident victims, and while Nick and Lori are there, they run into the tampon mom, Samantha, and her husband. Samantha is played by Krista Allen, who, I've got to say, is trying her damnedest in this role. She's come a long way from getting ogled at by... I did not realize that was her. Man. Uh, everyone's just been so nice. Yeah, it's because you got big jugs. I mean, your boobs are huge. I mean, I want to squeeze them. <laughs> By Jim Carrey in an elevator. Mama! They thank Nick for saving their family with fur. <laughs> that was so good. <laughs> liar, liar is such a classic flick, dude. <clears throat> draft generic dialogue while bland, sappy music plays in the background. Take care. Thank you. This movie had a new composer after the woman who wrote the music for the first three films. Oh, uh, yeah, that's when Shirley died, man. Damn. Shirley Walker sadly died of a stroke in 2006. <sighs> Rest in peace, you amazing woman. She also composed a lot of the music for the Batman animated series. Uh, she was amazing, dude. Like, just hearing her work and everything, just... So good. At the time of her death, she had apparently scored more major motion pictures than any other American woman. And her work included James Wong and Glenn Morgan's other horror projects like Willard and the Black Christmas remake. Even the first film she worked on was horror, 1984's Ghoulies, which she co-composed oh with Richard Bann. Rest in peace, Shirley. At the memorial, Nick and Lori also formally meet George, who's played by master shrimper Michael T. Williamson, previously seen on The Kill Count as Joe Dixon in Purge Election Year, where I somehow forgot to point him out. Dude was Benjamin Buford Blue. How could I miss that? <laughs> yeah, Bubba. Bubba! You know what? My name's Benjamin Buford Blue, but everyone called me Bubba like one of them old redneck boys. Can you believe that? <laughs> like, what's wrong with your lip? I was born with big gums, sir. I'm on a trip. You, you may want to tuck that in. Don't want to get caught on a tripwire. <laughs> 
Before George can tell the kids all the ways you can serve shrimp, racist Carter walks up and blames George for his wife's death. I wanted to go in there after him, but... He spits a hard N-word at George and threatens him as he leaves. Later that night, Nick has visions in a dream, which are honestly just embarrassing. I feel like these are clues in an old mist game. Should you get the red pages, Nick, or the blue ones? Nick Jesus. doesn't know it yet, but that shitty vision... This has better clues than that. <laughs> Don't you diss on mist. Oh my gosh. Drunk-ass racist Carter driving a tow truck. I've one through four now, like, since I grew up. So, like, they're a lot e or I would say they're easy, but they're a lot more manageable when you're not a kid trying to play them. Yeah. Up to George's house, where the security guard is shockingly shading in his character by reading from an AA book. Oh, and there's a picture with a lady in the back there, too? Wow, it's like he's a real person. Not yeah. Nice. But racist Carter doesn't see George as a person, and after the guard's lights go down, he gets straight to work putting up a cross to burn in George's front yard. Death also gets straight to work and knocks a bunch of stuff over until Carter's truck is driving on its own and playing Wars Why Can't We, we Be Friends be loudly friends. through its speakers, which does admittedly make for some pretty funny music backing as racist Carter gets caught by the truck's hook and dragged down the street. Between sparks and gas, a fire gets going, and racist Carter is killed in what ends up being an outright comedy scene. That feels Why straight can't out of we scary be movie, friends? Complete with the explosion that produces a severed burning head. Props to actor Justin Wellborn, who did a partial burn stunt and was actually dragged down the street under the supervision of stunt coordinator Jeffrey J. Dashnock. And double props to stunt performer Steve Davison, who did a full body burn while being dragged down Ooh. the street. You know how I love a good fire stunt. Now put that guy out, you crazy kid. <laughs> As though racist Carter's death wasn't enough of a self-parody already, when new of his death is on TV the next day, we get a scene that's literally in the satirical horror comedy Cabin in the Woods, with a red-headed heroine standing around in her underwear. Yeah, yeah, uh, I love the fact that they make fun of that in Cabin in the Woods, just like, and you aren't wearing any pants. And then, <laughs> and it's just, oh, jeez, uh, it's so good. Or solely for the sake of the camera. This movie is so bad and dumb so that it's fan inadvertently. Service. Yes. Well, I'm not really a fan of this, but it's it's just she is nice to look at. Yes, of course she is. Be a template for parodies. Nick has another crappy looking vision that brings him images of scissors and cigarettes, an alt rock album title if I've ever heard one. And he tells Lori that he thinks his dream from the previous night foretold him of the flaming tow truck incident. He's <coughs> dead. Haha, <laughs> yep, he is. Samantha and her kids are still alive, but she's now in danger according to Nick's PlayStation 1 cutscenes. She sends her little monsters to an arcade with some money, then goes to get her hairs cut at a beauty salon. Ooh, and a petty. Damn, Sam, you treating yourself, huh? The salon's various tools and accessories conspire to create a slippery floor and a hairspray bottle bomb, but those end up being red herrings. Although her kids eat shit and the bomb goes off, the ceiling fan it dislodges doesn't fall on Samantha. Instead, she's killed after a line of blunt foreshadowing. I've got my eye on you two. When a stone hit by a lawnmower mm -hmm. across the street goes straight through her eye. And if you're wondering why Samantha gets killed, but not her husband or kids, I guess maybe Maybe they would have escaped the disaster either way, whereas Sam was left behind getting trampled by the crowds before that engine fell on her. <laughs> News of We never saw them die, so yeah, mm. it would make sense. Samantha's death makes it into the paper, but it doesn't seem to phase the horny hunt. We just lost a really hot milf. Hey, does that guy like sex and stuff? I yeah, that's his only character trait. It's like, I like sex. Also, I'm a blonde douche. <laughs> haven't been able to tell. Nick and Lori tell Hunt and Janet about the visions he's been having, as well as the history they've learned about similar past incidents like Flight 180. Also, and I'm so skeptical as if a lawnmower would actually throw a rock hard enough to go through your head like that. Like, I've heard of people going blind because they were hit in the eye with a rock that a lawnmower threw, but I don't know about it turning it into a bullet. Let's see. I 
can't remember if they say it's Ah, damn it. Can't remember if they say it's plausible or not. Oh, confirmed. Oh, okay. So it turns out it is lethal. Fair enough. Maybe <laughs> not to the degree that we saw in here, but... Dude, a rock like being fired at you from a lawnmower like that, if it goes over a certain certain speed, it's gonna do some damage. Uh, I've always heard my mom like, you know, she always told me not to go out when my dad was mowing, like, because if it picks up a rock, it could <coughs> end up hitting you with it. And well, yeah. I actually did uh, get hit with a small piece of uh, something at one point whenever somebody was mowing but it was just like a oh, fuck type thing. You know? Well, you see, for me that's why like anytime a lawn, I see a lawnmower that doesn't have like the side like thing that like aims down like that's the reason why those exist because you see, because even if a rock hits that, it's going to deflect and go down oh. which is which is why anytime I see a lawnmower without that I'm like, that's dangerous. Anyway. Those disasters, the survivors subsequently die. But we survived. So now does that mean we all die? Yes, that's exactly what that means. We're four movies in here. You know this, man. Nick <laughs> also shares the tried and true theory that another person's intervention will cause death to skip a kill. But this is all too much for Janet, and she leaves all freaked out. As for Hunt, he resigns himself to the possibility that maybe they're right, but he intends to carry on as per usual. So I'm going to do what I do best. I'm gonna go get laid. Wow, Hunt, you're so fucking cool, dude. <laughs> Nick unlocks another level in a free online flash game, and that inspires him to go back to the racetrack and try to jog <coughs> his memory of the order in which people died. He thinks back to all the deaths he saw in his premonition, but he can't remember who died after Samantha. Nick and Lori are then discovered by George, who responds to their theory sounding like George friggin' Washington. Young man, that sounds crazy. They watch the security cam footage that shows how dying is easy young man and nick sees enough to figure out death's order looks like the mechanic is next hey maybe if we can stop this mechanic from getting killed we can break the chain and the rest of us will all be safe <laughs> yeah dude nope. that'll definitely that's not how it works. Definitely happen. It works every time. They track down the mechanic, a guy named Andy, and visit him at the garage in which he works, which is a dangerous place indeed. Andy's been having a hard time ever since seeing his wife get squashed by a tire, and turns out George can relate to him since he recently lost his wife and daughter in a car accident he caused while drunk driving. George continues to develop his character while the others just kind of nod at him a bunch, not knowing that inside the garage, death is getting back to work again. When it finally springs its trap, a gas tank is launched that catches Andy in the chest and sends him flying partially through a metal fence. This is another kill where I don't know why it looks so bad, since on set they had a dummy with a pre-cut back that they pumped full of blood tubes and actually rammed through a fence. What the hell happened here? Moving down Death's list, no Nick idea. says that Hunt and Janet died at the same time in his premonition, so he splits with Lori and George in an effort to track down both of them. Hunt is predictably doing the only thing he claims to be good at, even though he taps out after finishing himself and leaves his lady partner unfulfilled. Oh, and look, he's already getting excited to disappoint another girl. But what? Hunt had better... Isn't that always how it works? Mm -hmm. It's just like, it's like, dude, no woman is gonna, lo is gonna want you, ever. If it's like, oh, he's a one-minute man? Okay, never mind then. Get away from that pool because Nick is seeing Except ominous for it signs. doesn't get around all of them, so as long as you're a hot douchebag, you'll get another one at some point. I don't know why women don't just proclaim it and just be like, be like, hey, you see this asshole here? Yeah, I slept with him. And guess what? He's a one-minute man. They Steer clear. They feel embarrassed to admit that. <laughs> but they did that. It's like, I was like, oh, I know. But it's like, oh, call me whatever you want, but I just want to put it out there. One minute man. That's it. Goodbye. Signs and more shitty visions warning him that water bad. 
fire good? Oh, and yeah, check out that not so subtle Easter egg referencing Allie Larder's character from parts Clear one and rivers. two. Her yeah. name was Clear Rivers, not Claire. I was never saying it wrong, she just had a dumb name. Hunt gets into a fight with a little kid who gives two of the funniest no's I've ever heard in my life. Give me the gun. No! Give me the fucking gun. No! After confiscating the gun by force, no. Hunt discards it in a way that ends up turning on the pool pump, which recently must have gotten turbocharged or some shit, cause look at that thing. That's some overkill. Yeah, Me yeah that's so bullshit. Ridiculous. While Janet the personality list is also putting herself in water's way by getting an automatic car wash, a fact she mentions to Lori on the phone. She loses reception before Lori can warn her about the dangers of Agua, but it's already too late. A mechanical failure caused by a wayward car antenna stops Janet's car in its tracks, right in the middle of those fun spinny washer things. Janet's sunroof opens and a big pipe burst, sending her screaming towards a prestigious death. When Hunt's lucky coin rolls its way into the pool, he dives in after it, only to get caught by the super pool pump pulling at his bum. My bum is on the drain. My bum is on the drain. The pressure keeps building and it's causing lots of pain. So now... <laughs> now he's going to have to chew through his prolapsed anus to escape. Oh gosh. Oh, he and Janet are in simultaneous situations of aquatic danger, with Janet's getting extra sudsy. But lucky for her, Lori and George drive into the car wash and save her from getting her face cleaned off. Their intervention saves her life, and she's rescued from water and pipe alike. But unfortunately for Hunt, Nick's unable to find him when he finally gets to the golf club pool. Hunt is killed when the pool pump reaches maximum pressure and sucks out his insides, which splash up into the screen, whoa, and land on the deck in a bloody mess. This nasty kill required actor Nick Zeno to get some underwater training, and the scene took three days to shoot. He'd have to stay down there while they got different shots, and in between takes, breathe through instruments like these hoses. Not too hard to act like you're drowning when that's going on. You gotta get in that headspace of death. Like, I'm dying, but then I'm underwater and I'm tied to the bottom of the pool. Then you start losing your cool. It becomes very real, very fast. Oh, also, the digital blood in this scene apparently has an excuse. They were shooting at a public pool and couldn't contaminate the water with any fake blood. So they say, at least. Since they successfully intervened to save Janet's life, the survivors figure that death is either done with them completely or it'll skip her and move on to George. Either way, George ain't worried. Heather, I'm at then... peace with it. And um, my family's waiting for me. I'm ready to go. And so that night, George decides to end his own life. Nick and Lori come over to check on him and find him hanging from the ceiling. But hey, he's not dead yet. Although, turns out, not for lack of trying. I've been trying to kill myself all day. Since George has... Definitely ought to blur that. <laughs> Can't show that on YouTube nowadays. For multiple reasons. Because mm -hmm. <coughs> it's like, yeah, they don't like showing stuff like that, but also... <laughs> It's a black dude hanging from a rope. Mm -hmm. Ugh. It's just two kinds of terrible. ...has been unable to kill himself. They think that means death really has given up on them entirely. Awesome! Let's pop some 3D champagne corks. Whoa! To life. What do y'all got planned for it? Lots of traveling, <laughs> like Paris, maybe some beaches, Saint-Tropez. Saint-Tropez? What? Aren't you college students? Where's all this globe-trotting money coming from? Sam and Lori may have been premature with their travel plans anyway, since all of a sudden, Nick has another vision that includes some water dripping and a 3D snake. Yes. Yeah. A news report reveals that there was another survivor from the racetrack they didn't know about. That tall cowboy, a guy named Jonathan Groves. He was rescued in the rubble, which is not the same fate we saw him suffer in the premonition. But if I would have asked him to move like I did in the premonition, he would have died. Instead, he survived. That means Jonathan Groves must be the next one on death's list, which is why Nick and George rush to the hospital where he's being taken care of. Also residing in the very same hospital is a racist old man. You know how many of your kind I killed in Korea. So Once again, just blatantly racist.
no fun watching assholes all the time. The old dude's tub starts to overfill with water after the nurses leave him alone. And it looks like his room must be right above the cowboys, because now there's a waterfall coming down on his head. Jonathan Groves actually manages to get out of his bed and crawl across the room, but by the time Nick and George find him, it's too late. The tub falls through the floor and crushes him. I'm not entirely sure if it makes sense for the tub to be there when the leaks began right over Jonathan's bed all the way on the other side of the room. But my editor Zorin says it makes sense for some reason, so I don't feel comfortable berating it as stupid. Maybe yeah, I'm I mean, like, the water was flowing out of the tub onto the floor, it leaked through the floor, which leaked through the entire ceiling of the previous room. Yeah. The, the room below. So. Plus the placement, I think, matches because he's crawling over to one side of the room and his bed would be against the wall way back here, but I don't know. The stupid one. Who knows? Lori and Janet, the two most useless and underwritten characters in this whole damn series, are at the mall to see a movie. So that's where Nick and George head next, while George tells Nick a bit about his late wife. It's like deja vu. My wife said that deja vu is like God's will. Whoa, okay, we're doing that kill again. Damn. I mean, I knew the dude had to die, but now we're down to exactly zero interesting characters. Bummer. While Lori and Janet make their way to the theater, we see a lot of construction going on outside and within the mall, giving us lots of dangerous details that these characters should be looking out for. You know, maybe they could stay <coughs> safe if their parents had taught them to fear and respect the escalator. But I guess they didn't, since Lori's shoelace gets caught. Thankfully, Take it your shoe off. off before a bloodbath can ensue, leaving the girls safe for now. Nick arrives at the mall and has another vision that shows the girls being killed when their theater blows up into a fireball. Sure enough, death's already gusting winds about and soaking sawdust in flammable chemicals in a room under construction that's right behind the screen in Lori and Janet's theater. They're there to see the latest shitty 3D movie, Love Lays Die. But Nick has a hard time finding which theater they're in, since apparently this thing's having an endgame sized opening. He Jesus. eventually manages to track them down, and he gets Lori to leave with him before the fire that's broken out backstage can spread to some barrels that are spontaneously combustible. I'm sorry, what? You mean... Yeah, yeah, that's, that's kind of stupid. stupid ass sticker. That's... In their combust. Yeah, they don't just right? combust spontaneously. Because spontaneously combustible would mean they're apt to blow up at literally any time. Nitroglycerin is spontaneously combustible. That's just not really. It's just nitroglycerin is unstable. As long as it's sitting still and kept in proper environments, it's not gonna just combust out of nowhere. I guess, yeah. Do you really think there would be <clears throat> spontaneously combustible barrels lying around a construction site movie? Behind a fucking movie screen? Yeah, it's really fucking dumb. Safety stand. I'm sorry. Every safety standard in the world would just be like, eh, eh, nope. Cause that's just fucking stupid. Anyway, Janet refuses to budge, so when that barrel spontaneously combusts, she's killed alongside all the other theater patrons, who are not only blown up, but also stabbed and stuff. We get some variety here. Props to the stunt performers being flung around on cables, and props to the crew who actually blew up a theater facade for real. Movie making is fine. The fire continues to spread and causes one, two, three more big explosions in the mall. And as, wait, sorry, four, four. more big explosions in the mall. The last one tears apart the escalator, which finally gives us the bloodbath that was promised when Lori is pulled into its exposed gears and squeezed like a Ooh. bottle of toothpaste. Great use of some soft fake legs made by makeup artist Mike McCarty of KB. It's an awesome and graphic kill. Ooh. Oh shit, kills? Have I been forgetting to count kills this whole time? <laughs> I have, probably because those all took place inside a secret eyeball mall. Whoa! My wife said that deja vu is like God's way. <laughs> Whoops, yeah, that was all another premonition. Damn. <laughs> I don't remember that either. But unfortunately, Nick's unable to save George from his ambulance death the second time around. It happens off screen in reality here, but we did see it take place like during the vision. So when it comes to the awards, I'm gonna have to factor that in. Nick races off to the mall in order to stop the <coughs> explosion, and he's able to find the construction site fire before it's reached critical spontaneous combustion levels. Although he puts out the initial fire, death uh, finds a way and ends up shooting off a nail gun, which pins Nick to the wall and starts a stream of 
of spontaneously flammable liquid that's headed straight towards a second fire. But Nick thinks fast and uses the world's longest tiki torch to set off the fire sprinklers in the room, which puts out the fire before the barrels can get hot enough to spontaneously explode. The 3D movie watchers in that theater don't even know how good they have it. And I'll tell you what, it's a lot better than us 3D movie watchers have it, because we're stuck with this piece of shit. Two weeks later, mm -hmm. the three survivors meet at their favorite coffee shop, where they're laughing and having a good time. Hell, Nick's even known as a local hero. You saved a lot of lives, man. Thanks, random guy. But this happy ending doesn't stay happy for long, since Nick starts getting a bad feeling about everything he sees, and not just the shitty acting. What do you think, babe? Hey, uh, space cadet, you want to come back down to Earth? The movie ends with another disaster that kills all three of them. But since it cuts to the end credits, they're shown in that cool x-ray style that was used in the opening credits. Not a bad way to do some stinger kills like that. Although, honestly, I'm just happy this thing is over. How many cartoonish kills were flung into yeah. our faces here? Let's find out and get to the numbers. Heads or tails? Nope. <laughs> see? See? That is way better animated than any of the fucking debris that fell in this movie. <laughs> see, look at that. Sadly, look at that. Yes, it is. Look at that. And I know it's like, I know this is like, this was made in 2009, and this is like a an app thing that they have nowadays in, when was this made? 2019, but still, dude. That's a cheap, that's cheap. And this movie cost... <coughs> Hold on. <coughs> Real quick. How much did this movie cost to make? Hopefully not too much. The Final Destination. There it is. Okay. $40 million. Jeez, us. Christ almighty. Ugh. Dude. I... Also, it's just, um, I feel like I saw that in theaters, and I feel like it doesn't look as bad with the 3D. Probably. Yeah, probably. One of the things is like, why does this look so bad? Why does this look so bad? It might just be because it was originally meant to be in that 3D, and the 3D hide, it like hid a lot of the bad. I don't yeah. know if that's just my memory failing me or what. I don't know, man. This film's just bad. Let's just chalk it up to that. 61 people died in the final destination, and as per usual with this series, most of them, 51 in fact, were of indeterminable gender. The others were four women and six men, giving us this mostly gray pie chart. And with a runtime of only 82 minutes, that left us with a kill on average every 1.34 minutes. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to Hunt. He's one of my least favorite characters of all time, but man, did he die well. This death is unique and splashtastically gory, of course, but it also gets points for the psychological horror going on here. He's surrounded by other people in the pool who he can't contact and who don't know he's in trouble. That's some scary shit, man. Dull machete for lamest kill will go to Jonathan Groves, crushed by a bathtub that maybe shouldn't have been there logically. And in the final <laughs> Destination series, I'm giving out the Primo Premonition Award for the coolest kill seen only in a vision. This time it'll go to Lori's death during the second premonition. Yeah, she was that's, pretty, that's pretty brutal. And turned into human go -Gurt. This was also the film's late director David Ellis' favorite kill. Um, it's gross. Yes, it is, David. Yes, it is. And that's it. The Final Destination came out in 2009 in glorious 3D and is definitely one of my least favorite films I've covered on the Kill Count. Thankfully, the fifth film is actually pretty good. I'll show you next week. Until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching this week's Kill Count. I'd like to thank some patrons like Nicholas Beauchamp, Alex Green, Danielle Colwell, Aiden Galloway, Taylor, and Ayeli. Hopefully my voice wasn't too grating during this. It actually hurt me a lot to film this, but I had to get it done. Schedules are a thing. 3D, whoa. I just had to film some time, sorry. <laughs> Thanks everyone, be good people. <clears throat> All right. Well, damn. Uh this just wow wow god this is such a bad film yeah, I, it's pretty crappy yeah
Definitely the worst Final Destination film. Definitely. Whereas, I don't know, man. The five is obviously my favorite. Then after that, I don't know. I really don't know. I think the first one probably is the strongest other than the last one. Yeah, probably. Has and the has the better really, characters. And it hasn't really been done before at that point. So That's true. Something kind of unique and new. Yeah. <clears throat> I remember people talking about it like years after it came out. Yeah, I remember too. It was like a lot of people fell in love with that film. <clears throat> and rightfully so. It's a good film. It, it's uh, overall, I would say it has the better characters. It has the better characters, and also it's the mo- it's the most fresh, like take of the of the franchise. But all right, anyway, that's gonna do it, everybody. So this was the final destination, two thousand nine kill count. Four years it took us to do this, but we finally did it. Thank you all so much. Till next time, I'm Nate. I am Nick. Y'all be good people. Take care. Peace.